Hello everybody and welcome to Nutrition 101. Today we are going to discuss carbohydrates, which are one of the macronutrients, and they are compounds that are found in foods that are composed of molecules called hydrocarbons. These are the probably the most important caloric nutrient for you to get in your diet and makes up the bulk of the calorie needs of your body and is the form of energy that is most utilized and most efficiently utilized by your body's cells. Carbohydrates can be broken up into three groups. Those would be monosaccharides, which are sugars, polysaccharides, which are starches, and undigestible polysaccharides, which are known as fiber. Now, I just mentioned the major role of carbohydrates is to provide energy to your cells, and they have four calories per, or four kilocalories per gram, as we've discussed previously. Carbohydrates are found mostly in plants, except for the carbohydrate lactose, which is a type of sugar found in dairy products. And 60% of our daily calories should come from carbohydrates. This means that if you are on a 2,000 calorie diet and 60% of your calories need to come from carbohydrates, that means that your diet should contain 300 grams of carbohydrates. And now all carbo carbohydrates are ultimately digested into monosaccharides, whether they are starches or um, disaccharides, and even fibers can be digested by the bacteria in your gut into sugar alcohols and other sugars that your body doesn't necessarily use for energy. So simple sugars um, are the monosaccharides and disaccharides. Saccharides are sugar and um, these are generally named using a common suffix OSE or OSE. Uh, this indicates that it's a sugar. So some monosaccharides, which are single molecule sugars, are fructose, gluc glucose, and galactose. You will probably recognize at least fructose from food labeling. And then the disaccharides are lactose, which comes from milk. That is a glucose and a galactose molecule connected together. These, this comes only from animals. Then there's maltose, which is two glucose molecules hooked together, and sucrose, which is table sugar, which is extracted from things like beets and sugarcane, and this is a glucose and a fructose molecule bonded together. Excuse me. So sugars are made in plants by the process of photosynthesis in the leaves of the plant. Um, this is the combination of water and carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight to produce sugar and oxygen, which is then converted, combined later on in animals to produce energy. So here is a diagram of that. So energy from the sun comes in, carbon dioxide from the air, water from the ground, and the plant now has glucose in it. They use this to feed their seeds and to grow their seeds, and they also use vitamins and minerals from the soil to store in their seeds as well. Here is a nice diagram of a grain kernel. and there, So we see here most of the plant is um, stem and husk, but then inside of the husks there is a tiny little kernel of wheat. This is the part that contains nutrients and fiber. It consists of several parts. The endosperm, which is the meaty part that contains all the starches and a lot of the protein. The germ, which is the seed part that grows into a plant, which is especially rich in vitamins. And then the outer husk is inedible. Whereas the bran, which is the protective coating of the seed, has many nutrients and a lot of fiber in it. This is the reason that whole grain products tend to be considered healthier than, than refined grain products because 
whole grain products contain the germ and the bran, as well as the endosperm, which gives them a higher nutritional value. There are several common types of flour. White flour, which is endosperm flour that's been refined and bleached to the point of maximum softness and whiteness. Then there is unbleached flour, which is generally tan. This is also endosperm flour, and it has very similar texture, texture and nutritive qualities as white flour. Wheat flour can mean any of the flours made from wheat, including white flour or unbleached flour or whole wheat flour. However, regular wheat flour is, has, been, has had the bran refined out, whereas whole wheat flour has not. So here's a bigger picture of just the kernel. So out here on the outside is the bran, and here is the endosperm, and here is the germ. You've probably, if you've ever picked a seed or a nut apart, you could probably identify these portions. Now, in the early 1900s, we started milling our grains very stringently and bleaching them to kill spoilage molds and fungi and things like that. And in the process, we leached out many of the valuable nutrients that are present in the grain. So we passed a law called the Enrichment Law in the face of mounting nutrient, nutrient deficiencies, which allows, which requires the addition of certain vitamins and minerals to wheat that has been bleached. Now there are a number of different ways to describe grains and cereals and they can be possibly misleading. Uh, just because a bread is brown doesn't mean that it's a whole grain bread. A good example of that is brown bread which is typically a heavy caramelized bread that may or may not be made with whole grain flour, uh, but is often colored with caramel. Uh, enriched flour is the process of adding nutrients back to a refined flour. This means that there is a minimum amount of iron, folate, niacin, thiamine, and riboflavin added to this grain. And those are all B vitamins except for iron, which is iron. Now, refining flour involves removing the coarse parts of the food products, and in the process, you remove a lot of the fiber. Same with su refined sugar. Sugar is generally refined by removing the cellulose components of sugar beets or sugar cane. Stone ground only means that it was ground with stone. It doesn't do anything special to the bread. Uh, it doesn't even mean that the grain is whole grain flour. It just means they used a stone to grind it. Unbleached flour, again, has been refined and had the bran extracted from it without being bleached. It doesn't re the bleaching doesn't make as much of a difference as you'd think. Wheat flour is any flour made from wheat. White flour is flour that has been bleached. And this is most all-purpose flours and cake flours. Then there's whole grain flour again, has the bran in it, and whole wheat flour is unrefined um, so that there may actually be little bits of bran in there. Um, here's a diagram showing a number of different nutrients and their relative content in whole grain bread versus enriched white bread versus unenriched white bread. So first of all, for the whole grain bread, all of these are present in plentiful quantities. However, even in enriched bread, you don't get as much iron or zinc or fiber as you would get, despite the fact that you probably will get plenty of B vitamins. And you can see here, unenriched white bread has all of these things missing from it. So now we're going to talk about monosaccharides. So monosaccharides all have the same chemical formula, C6H12O6, which you may or may not have taken chemistry before, but you may have encountered this formula. Uh, there in chemistry, there are things called isomers, 
of which glucose, fructose, and galactose are isomers of this chemical formula, C6H12O6. Isomers means they have the same atoms and um, elemental content, but they're rearranged in different shapes. All three of these are absorbed directly into the bloodstream and eventually become glucose, which is used to power the body and raise your blood sugar. Uh, notice here, glucose and galactose both have hexagonal structures, and fructose has a pentagonal structure, and that is a main difference between the two of them. This molecule is smaller and more easily absorbed by the body. Here's another picture showing, um, all, showing the presence of, the, of oxygen in these sugars. So the thing about carbohydrates versus other hydrocarbons is the readily available oxygen content, which is important when you start to break these molecules down to make energy. They release water. Now, glucose is the most abundant sugar molecule in our diet. It's generally the, the energy source of our cells. Uh, the other two sugar molecules are ultimately converted into glucose in the liver after absorption, but glucose can go directly into any cell in your body and be used for energy. Galactose doesn't occur alone in foods. It only comes from lactose, lact, lactose molecules being broken down in the small intestine. And fructose is so named because of its presence in fruit. And it is the sweetest natural sugar because it is absorbed very readily, even though it doesn't actually raise your blood sugar as fast as glucose does. And here's another diagram. So showing the different structures of glucose, fructose, and galactose as monosaccharides, then they, these can combine with one another in what we call disaccharides, which are two sugar molecules bonded together. And there are three combinations we generally encounter in nutrition. So there are, there's a glucose molecule bonded to a galactose molecule, which makes a lactose molecule. There is a glucose bonded to a glucose, which makes maltose, which is found in many um, fermented beverages. And then there's glucose plus fructose, which makes sucrose, which is table sugar. And that's found in a lot of different foods. Here's a little bit more detail. Um, these monosaccharides, galactose and glucose, combine together, and they lose a water molecule to form this disaccharide, lactose, also called milk sugar. And the important thing to notice here between lactose and, say, maltose, which shows a two glucose coming together, releasing a water molecule, is that this bridging oxygen atom is has a different structure in maltose uh, that, uh, as opposed to lactose, which is important in digestion because you need an enzyme for every type of bond. So some people lack the enzyme lactase, which is what breaks this type of bond in the disaccharide lactose. And this leads to something we know as lactose intolerance. And in fact, here is this shown again. We call the bond in a lactose molecule a beta bond, as opposed to the, the one in sucrose or maltose being an alpha bond. And here, I just mentioned this, lactase is the enzyme that breaks this beta bond. And therefore, you cannot digest the sugars in milk. This doesn't mean that you're allergic to milk, although milk allergy does exist. That is a separate condition in which you have an anaphylactic response to the proteins in milk. Um, this is a condition that causes gastric distress after dairy consumption, which can cause diarrhea and pain diet constipation, bloating, um, and other unpleasantness. However, people who have lactose intolerance may be able to digest yogurt and aged cheeses because, as you may imagine, the bacteria and enzymatic processes in the cheese and the yogurt breaks down the lactose and makes it not a problem.
And here's a map showing the prevalence of lactose intolerance globally. Red being a high percentage, green or gray being a low percentage. Much of the world that has been tested has a low percentage of lactose intolerance, with some places in Africa being up in the 20s. And then places like Sub-Saharan Africa and China being up in the high, nearly 100% pre prevalence. Another interesting piece of information is that uh, Native Americans and African Americans, as well as Australian Aborigines, all have a high instance of lactose intolerance, likely due to the largely absent um, cultivation of domesticated livestock. So this brings us to the way that sugar is actually represented on food labeling. Uh, sugar has an understandably bad rap in the nutrition community due to the fact that it is implicated in many health issues, especially in the United States. Uh, diets high in added sugars tend to increase the risk for heart disease and diabetes and um, obesity. So they name it things like barley malt or dextrose. Dextrose, by the way, is just glucose. Maltose is a sugar. Rice syrup is just sugar syrup. Fruit juice concentrates, that generally means fructose. Turbinado sugar is just sugar. Date sugar, still sugar. Molasses, oh. Molasses is maybe slightly different because it has vitamins and minerals in it, but in general it's sugar plus a little bit of color. Uh, the American Heart Association recommends no more than nine teaspoons of added sugar per day. That's not very much. That's less than a can of soda. Six teaspoons for women. And children generally shouldn't get more than like three to six. And children under two should get none. Despite that, the average American consumes 66 pounds of sugar a year, which is five and a half pounds per month. That's a lot of sugar. And most of it's hidden in things like... Um, salad dressings and condiments and bread. A lot of bread has sugar in it. Pasta sauces have sugar in them. Yogurt. One of the things that you can do is go to the grocery store and look at yogurt containers and then scroll down and try to find the one or two that doesn't have sugar in them and eat that because sugared yogurt is redundant. And Overconsumption of sugar sweeteners promotes systemic inflammation similar to smoking, which depletes your immune system and makes your life generally more uncomfortable, as well as desensitizing you to things like insulin and lowering your energy levels and increasing your body fat percentage. So now that we've talked about sugars, we can move on to polysaccharides, which are a chain of sugars that are found in carb-rich foods like fruits, vegetables, tubers, beans, and grain products, and they can come in several forms. Um, here's a nice picture of a bunch of things that have carbs in them. Now, an interesting thing about bread is that it has a lot of carbohydrates, especially starches and sugars, but it also contains protein and fat. Obviously, the, if you use whole grain flour in your bread, it will also contain vitamins and minerals. Because the grain is ground so finely, it doesn't take a lot to digest it and convert it into disaccharides, which makes it what we call a higher glycemic food, meaning that it readily releases glucose into your bloodstream and it does so at a rapid rate. Now, whole grains have more fiber in them, which generally slows the digestion of sugars and starches into disaccharides, which makes it a lower glycemic food.
And here are three different types of polysaccharides. There are starches, which is the, are the way that plants store glucose. So are, there are things like grains, legumes, and tubers. They have something called amylose or amylopectin, which are long branching chains of what you can see are hexagonal glucose molecules strung together by a little oxygen. There's another type called fiber, which is a rigid uh, structure uh, bearing uh, collection of molecules and things like cellulose and um, other uh, lignins can be considered fiber because your body doesn't break them down. These are things that are found in the leaves and stems of plants. And then uh, other things like pectin, which is found in apples, are another example of fiber. And then glycogen, which is another branching carbohydrate glucose chain that's found in the muscles of animals and the liver. And this is the way that your body stores glucose so that it can rapidly access large amounts of it. So fiber is probably one of the more overlooked carbohydrates. Uh, there are two types, soluble and insoluble. Uh, and this refers to their ability to be absorbed into your bloodstream. Now fibers are what we call prebiotic, meaning that they feed your gut microbiome and provide the bacteria there with food. Um, fibers are generally non-digestible carbohydrates and they lend a feeling of fullness to your meal which could possibly help you to eat less and regulate your portion sizes it also helps your large intestine to move all of your waste through you and prevent things like di diverticulosis and colon cancer Now, just like lactose and sucrose are different, the bonds in starch and cellulose are different. It's the same type of beta bonding. Um, so the reason that we can digest starch is that our bodies readily cleave glucoses off by breaking this alpha bond. However, cellulose has beta bonds and these are not readily cleaved by enzymes. So cellulose becomes an insoluble fiber. The advantages of a high fiber diet include a decreased risk of constipation, a decreased risk of diverticula, decreased risk for hemorrhoids, appendicitis, decreased risk of complications from diabetes because it helps regulate blood sugar. Um, it helps make you feel full to decrease your food intake. It can decrease the risk for cancer because you are feeding your gut microbiome, which is reducing inflammation, which is one of the risk factors for cancers. And you can also help reduce your blood cholesterol by lowering your blood triglyceride count. There's another type of starch, which is sort of like insoluble or sort of like a soluble fiber it's technically a starch but it resists digestion and it makes it to your colon where bacteria break it down into short chain fatty acids these are generally present in underripe fruits or unprocessed grains and vegetables uh, things that are high in amylose it also is found in potatoes and rice that is cooked and then cooled before eating. It's also known as retrograde starch. And these can be made into short-chain fatty acids, which are consumed by your gut colony. And we'll talk about fatty acids when we talk about lipids. So there are two types of fiber. There are insoluble and soluble. Things like cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignins are all types of insoluble fibers. And they generally accelerate GI transit time 
increase fecal weight, decrease constipation, slow starch digestion, slow sugar absorption, and interfere in reabsorption of bile, which is a cholesterol compound. Soluble fiber, on the other hand, consists of things like gums, pectins, some hemicelluloses, some mucilages, and also resistant starches. These generally delay transit time, so they might make it it take longer for you to go to the bathroom. They also delay glucose absorption and they lower blood cholesterol. They help keep you hydrated and they feed microorganisms in your body which improves your immunity which helps um, increase serotonin levels. Food sources of these fibers, things like brown rice are good sources of insoluble fiber, fruits and vegetables with a peel on, green beans, nuts, rice bran, seeds, because they have the, um, the bran on the outside, wheat, which wheat bran or whole grains, which all have the bran. And then soluble fibers come from things like apples, barley, broccoli, carrots, corn, legumes, grapefruit, oats and oat bran, oranges, and retrograded rice and potatoes. Now, a good example of soluble fiber is if you've ever made oatmeal, if you look at the water that's in the oatmeal as it's cooking, it's become viscous and thick. The, pro the compounds that make this happen are soluble fibers. And once more, just for reinforcement of the point, this is what happens if you don't get enough fiber, your colon gets backed up with feces and then it forms little cavities that it gets trapped in and creates inflammation. Now, the American Dietet Dietetic Association suggests that you get 20 to 30 grams of fiber daily, which is about two times higher than the average American intake. Now, just to give you an example, that's like three and a half bowls of Cheerios will get you to the amount of soluble fiber that you need. And here is a nice little graph that shows the fiber content of a number of foods. So you can see here things like beans have a lot of fiber in them. Navy beans have the most with almost 10 grams per half cup serving. Lentils are coming in here around 8 with black beans maybe down a little bit lower than eight, and lima beans and kidney beans hanging out down around six. Broccoli has about five. Corn has mm, five-ish. Uh, the rest of these have a decent amount. Blackberries have a re pretty large amount of fiber, probably because of all the seeds in them. Um, pears have pectin, and therefore have a decent amount of fiber. They don't show apples on here, but apples would probably fall in the same location. Breads generally don't have a lot of fiber in them unless they're whole wheat, and even then they still don't have that much fiber. Uh, Cheerios have more, which Cheerios are an oat cereal. They have about three grams of fiber per serving. Oatmeal, instant oatmeal has about four. If you were to go into some fancy oatmeal like Bob's Red Mill or whatever, extra thick rolled oats, you'd probably be getting up into the six range just like these other whole grains. Here's a diagram to illustrate the importance of consuming whole fruits as opposed to things like fruit juices. If you look here, we got pineapple, orange, and apple. If you have a cup of fresh pineapple chunks, it has 76 calories, 19 grams of carbohydrates, and 2 grams of fiber. If you make that into juice and don't even add any sugar to it, you basically double the calories, you almost double the carbohydrate content, but you half the fiber content. Same thing with oranges. One cup of fresh orange segments has 85 calories, 21 grams of carbohydrates, and 4 grams of fiber. Orange juice has 111 calories, 26 grams of carbohydrates, and 1 gram of fiber. And an apple, a raw apple, has 65 calories, 16 grams of carbohydrates, and 3 grams of fiber. If you leave the peel on, it goes up to 4 grams of fiber. And apple juice has a lot more calories, 
significantly more carbohydrates and very little fiber because apple juice is generally boiled which makes all of the pectin come out of the juice as well so you don't even have soluble fiber and here is another fun list of a bunch of different foods with a with the amount of fiber they have breads and cereals generally have single digit grams of fiber same with fruits and fruit juices everything here is under 10 even for vegetables however beans all of them are over 10 legumes so it's a good rule of thumb that if you need fiber you should eat some more beans some people have issues with gas and beans um, however if you drain and rinse your beans before you prepare them it should eliminate that issue now there are obviously dietary recommendations for carbohydrates the Institute of Medicine recommends um, a dietary allowance of at least 130 grams of carbohydrates per day this is what's basically considered the minimum amount of carbohydrates to keep an adult alive Generally, carbs should account for 45 to 65 percent of your total daily energy intake, and t less than 25 percent of this should be added sugar. Now, in order to achieve this, there are a number of dietary guidelines, such as choosing fiber-rich fruits and vegetables and whole grains, choosing and preparing foods and beverages with little ad added sugars or caloric sweeteners. Um, following things like the USDA food guide and the DASH eating plan, and practicing good oral hygiene and consuming high sugar and high starch foods less frequently. So this brings us to the way that carbohydrates are dig digested. So we know what they all are now. We know what their role is. Um, now, monosaccharides like glucose, galactose, and fructose don't need to be digested. They are the molecules that your body needs, so they get absorbed directly into your bloodstream and lead to a quick spike in blood glucose. Now, glucose, I said before, goes directly in. Galactose and fructose move to the liver to be converted into glucose first. Now, disaccharides like sucrose, lactose, and maltose have to be digested into monosaccharides by the action of enzymes of which there is a special enzyme for each of these sugar molecules. Polysaccharide, polysaccharides like starch are digested into dextrins like maltose and then from there into monosaccharides. Fiber digestion is variable. It generally occurs due to the action of bacteria in the colon. And enzymes are involved in all these processes. The thing about fructose and galactose is that if you absorb too much at once, it gets transported to the liver and immediately stored as fat in the liver. Uh, this causes something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and it can be a big problem for obese people, especially people who consume high sugar diets. The, their blood sugar is high because they're eating a lot of carbs, and all of the glucose is being immediately used so that any fructose that gets transported to the liver has to be stored because there's no use for it. Sugar is always stored either as glycogen or as fat, and since glycogen is made of glucose molecules, then it's easy, more easy to make it into fat. The problem with this type of fat is that you don't burn it off until you until you have a proper body fat percentage in the rest of your body. So if you are overweight and you have fatty liver disease, you have to get not overweight and reestablish your healthy lifestyle before the fat on your liver will get eaten. So here is a diagram of this process. So you chew in your mouth. This stimulates the secretion of saliva, which contains amylase, which
which is an enzyme that breaks down sh starch into shorter polysaccharides and maltose. Now, the food then moves to your stomach, where the amylase from your saliva is destroyed by acid, and no digestion takes place here. After all the food is mixed up and exits the stomach, it moves into the small intestine, where the pancreas secretes amylase again, and this amylase breaks down the remaining starch into maltose, and the specific enzymes, maltase, sucrase, and lactase, in the small intestine will break down these disaccharides into monosaccharides. These are then absorbed by the small intestine and enter the bloodstream. Monosaccharides in the bloodstream travel to the liver, and this happens via something called the portal vein, and then they're converted to glucose, where they're at which point they're transported to cells for energy. And any extra glucose is stored in the gl is glycogen in the liver, or as fat. Some of these carbohydrates pass into the large intestine undigested, where bacteria ferment them, and the remaining fiber is excreted as feces. And once again, we're going to look just at the close-up of the microvilli in your intestines. So, the blood vessel comes in close to the surface. The sugar molecules literally diffuse over the barrier and into the bloodstream and are carried away. Now, there's one more type of molecule that's relevant called an oligosaccharide. This is a short chain saccharide that's 3 to 10 sugar molecules long that is not digestible by humans. I mentioned these when I talked about FODMAPs in the digestion lecture. Um, these are fermentable in the colon. They have names like raffinose and stachyose, and they occur in things like beans, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and whole grains. They can lead to uncomfortable gas and uh, are generally not uh, a, a desirable component of these foods, which is an, one of the reasons that people avoid them, despite their health benefits. Um, there's a supplement called Beano, which contains the enzyme required to break down these saccharides. It's called alpha-galactosidase. Um, and another thing that you can do is to discard the first if you when you, when you when you prepare these foods uh to dif discard the first water that comes from them so if with beans you soak them overnight you rinse them and discard that water and it removes many of these oligosaccharides uh with cabbage if you steam it and then discard the water that it was steamed in it has a similar effect There's another issue that crops up when talking about carbohydrates, and that's something called gluten sensitivity or celiac disease. Now, gluten is a protein that's found in grains. Um, now, despite the fact that it's a protein, it's found in carbohydrate sources. Um, people with celiac disease do not have the ability to process the gluten or have a allergic reaction to it which causes inflammation and scarring of the intestinal lining gluten is found in wheat rye and barley and um, it chronic exposure to gluten by someone with celiac disease will permanently damage their ability to absorb nutrients uh, so this is why it's important for people that have celiac disease to avoid gluten at all costs. Not only is it uncomfortable, but it will ruin your life. The reason that oatmeal sometimes indicates that it's not gluten-free is that it is often processed in the same plant as wheat, and so it can get the gluten on it. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about sugar. Is sugar bad for you? There's 
probably some controversy about this because sugar in and of itself is not necessarily bad for you. However, overconsumption of added sugars is one of the root causes of things like diabetes. It can cause hyperactivity in children. It can cause fattening. Uh, it's generally considered to be unnatural. Uh, however, it is in fact derived from a natural source. So that's, I guess, debatable. Uh, the thing about added sugars is they generally elevate your blood lipids as well as your LDL cholesterol and can cause cavities. Now, as you may have learned already, a cavity is when sugar deposits in your mouth grow bacteria which release corrosive chemicals which then dissolve your teeth away and lead to gum disease and rotting of the enamel. Uh, if it gets bad enough, it can reach the pulp cavity and cause a infection or a toothache and require a root canal. Um, this should have been in our discussion of the Enrichment Act of 1942. Um, I'm not going to talk about it again. Um, and I mentioned before something called the glycemic index. And this is relevant for the, the topic of added sugars because the glycemic index of a food is the measure of how much it increases your blood glucose. So added sugars tend to increase your blood, sugar, your blood glucose much more rapidly than naturally occurring sugars and starches in foods that have a high fiber content. So, Americans consume 25% of our calories in snacks. This is based on demographic research. Uh, this is probably due to the fact that many people stress eat almost exclusively. Um, Stress lowers your overall hunger, but increases your craving for snacks, uh, especially ones containing salt, sugar, and fat. And when you're snacking on processed carbohydrates, there is a good chance you're getting a lot of simple starches and a lot of added sugars. Now... In on top of all of the snacking, Americans also generally don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. Now, part of this is due to the fact that many Americans live below the poverty line in things called food deserts and don't have access to grocery stores. And so many millions of people live their dietary lives out of convenience stores where you mostly have access to packaged baked goods and dried fruits and things like that. Um, if you can manage to get five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, that could have a significant impact on your overall health. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of regular food, of a 100 calorie portion of regular food versus a sugar source. So something like milk, even 1% low-fat milk, one cup of it has 100 calories, 12 grams are carbohydrates, 8 grams are protein, and there's calcium, iron, vitamin A, and vitamin C. And all of these other foods have a widely diverse nutrient profile. Sugar generally just has carbohydrates, and it might have trace amounts of vitamins and minerals, especially if it's molasses. Here is an actual breakdown of the nutrients in four different types of sugar. So table sugar and raw sugar are essentially identical. Uh, there's no difference really except the color. Uh, honey has more calories per 
tablespoon because it has more fructose. Uh, the sugars have been broken down more. Um, there's also a little bit of protein and some B vitamins and minerals. Uh, blackstrap molasses, on the other hand, has the same amount of sugar and a lot of calcium and potassium for some reason. So honey is more kilocaloric, kilo um, it has potassium. The fact that sugar is made by honey, there's an enzymatic process in bees that splits the sucrose molecules down into fructose and glucose, which makes it very sweet. By the same metric, maybe if it's extra sweet, they'll use less of it. And I just mentioned molasses has the highest nutrient density. Now all this talk about sugar brings us to the concept of sugar replacements. So one of the natural sugar replacements is something called stevia or stevia. It's a plant from the sunflower family native to South and Central America that's widely grown for its sweet tasting leaves. It's used as a sweetener and sugar substitute, especially recently, and it can taste up to 300 times sweeter than sugar. It has no calories. And it is a bit controversial because people don't know how to categorize it and therefore it's actually been banned in some countries. Another one is agave nectar, which is a syrup taken from the agave plant, the agave cactus, which has a lower glycemic index and therefore helps to protect against the health issues associated with high glycemic sweeteners. These have fructose and glucose in them, and it is completely vegan. However, it does have calories, and therefore you can't just use a ton of it because it will still increase the amount of sugar you're consuming. There are a lot of other sugar alternatives too. So there are collections of um, what we call artificial sweeteners and then also sugar alcohols, which are different ways of achieving the same effect. Now, things like things that contain aspartame, uh, one of the things that is dangerous about aspartame is that it breaks down into phenylalanine which can be dangerous for people who have something called phenylketonuria, where they don't process phenylalanine properly. Uh, generally, the reason that people go for these sugar alternatives is they can chew things like gum and have candy, and it still tastes sweet, but it has 35% or 25% less calories, and it doesn't promote tooth decay. They can have their own issues, which we'll talk about. So sugar alcohols, things with names like mannitol or sorbitol or xylitol or lactitol, it's all just sugar molecules with an alcohol group attached to them. They're known as polyols. They generally have four kilocalories per gram, but they don't be, uh, get absorbed as well as sugar. So you can divide the grams of sugar alcohol by two to estimate the calories. Um, some food labels use a wording called net carbs or impact carbs. Um, this is just treating the fiber and polyol content as negative carbs, so they just subtract those from the total carbs. The thing about sugar alcohols is that they are not well absorbed and might cause gastrointestinal distress as a result. Now, an artificial sweetener is a generally a modified sugar molecule or amino acid that tastes sweet but is not broken down by the body for calories. Something like sucralose, which is brand name Splenda, is made from sucrose that has been modified so it can't be absorbed by the body. And it is thermally stable so you can cook with it. Another one called Neotame is ridiculously sweet and um, it's made by NutraSweet and uh, just for the information the FDA had to review 113 studies before approving it 
So a lot of times these have go, go on, undergo very rigorous testing to make sure they're not poisonous. And they still don't quite manage to not be poisonous. Uh, saccharin, which is sweet and low, is 300 times sweeter than sugar. Um, its safety is no longer a concern. Uh, there are other ones that are of varying safety, like acesulfame, potassium, and uh, aspartame. And here is a nice little table showing how much of a food containing aspartame somebody would have to consume in order to t get too much. So you'd need to drink, a 50 pound child would need to drink seven unsweetened soft drinks. Uh, and a 150 pound adult would have to drink 20. So you have to consume quite a bit of this stuff for it to be poisonous which I guess is good. And here's a graph of sweetnesses. So sucrose is set at a value of one. Um, most sugar alcohols have a, are, rel, are about 0.8 on the relative sweetness scale. So they actually taste less sweet than sucrose. Um, some of these artificial ones have Sweetness is hundreds of times greater than sucrose. Neotame is up in the seven to 13,000 times sweeter range, which seems a bit absurd to me, but I guess if you're trying to use as little material as possible to get the greatest effect, then that's what you want to do. And here's a table showing the equivalent amount of sweetener that you'd need to re to replace one teaspoon of sugar. So for something like saccharin, uh, you only need 12 milligrams to replace a teaspoon of sugar. Um, and the acceptable daily intake is five milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Most people weigh about 70 kilograms, which means that you could take in a very large amount. You can take in 350 milligrams of this. So you can see you're not getting there anytime soon. Uh, the rest of these have uh, various quantities that you can, that are equivalent in their uses. Um, this will be here for reference. And here are some more sugar replacers. These are polyols. Uh, you can see these are all less sweet than sugar but they also have less calories than sugar so they tend to be used in sugar-free candies and gums and jams and jellies um, and candy coatings things like maltitol because malt has a caramel color to it xylitol is a common one uh, because it is as sweet as sugar but it has half the calories. And that concludes our discussion of carbohydrates. Next time we'll discuss lipids, and then we'll talk about protein. And after that, we'll get into a bit about cellular respiration and how your body uses all of these molecules. Thanks for tuning in, and hope you have a good night.